From the European Parliament in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight. And this is what we have on the program for you. Deadline delay. UK Prime Minister Theresa May offers MPs a vote on pushing Brexit back. Brexit resurrection. The British opposition raises the prospect of a second referendum. Double standard. Austria proposes tough new rules for asylum seekers, including curfews and detentions. Anti-vax politics. A debate erupts after French families blame for reintroducing measles to Costa Rica. And on the run, Kim Jong-un's famous bodyguards arrive in Vietnam. It is time to meet our panelists for this evening. We have Darren McCaffrey, our political editor, is just back from Sharm el Sheikh. Literally off the plane yeah. from Cairo. Um, I'm really fascinated by the, the, the vaccination measles story. I think 110,000 people died, mainly kids, last year of measles. And yet, vaccination rates in Europe are falling, most notably in mm. France. And actually, there's this really interesting correlation, apparently, between people who vote for populists... And that is really ..and in, in particular countries, and rates of vaccination. It's, a, it's an argument, and it's a really interesting talking point, but it's clearly got very serious ramifications. It does, indeed. All right, joining us as well tonight is Nick Gottridge. He is Brussels, Brussels correspondent for The Sun. Nick, which of these stories are you watching closely? Uh, well, I think it's got to be the, the second referendum mm. stuff, the, the Brexit resurrection uh, with everything that's going on. Uh, obviously, the, the Labour leadership saying that it's going to, to back that was a surprise. Mm. Uh, it's really been forced by events and by its own MPs. Um, lots of people will say this makes the, the second referendum Brexit much twist. more likely. Yeah. But who knows? New Brexit twist there. All right, and joining us as well is Mia Petra Kampule Natri. She's a Finnish MEP from the Socialists and Democrats group here at the Parliament. Mia Petra, which of these stories are you watching closely? I'm watching and following what happens with the Brexit and mm -hmm. EU yeah. relations with the UK. I mean, indeed, lots of, <laughs> lots of people following that. We on, cannot no. get away from that. And that is exactly where we are beginning tonight. Because after months of ducking, prevaricating and delaying on Brexit, today, something rare from the British Prime Minister, a clear, bold decision. Theresa May says she won't offer just one vote to the House of Commons on Brexit, but three. A meaningful vote on her deal on March 12th, a no-deal vote on March 13th, and a vote to delay Brexit on March the 14th. And it's fair to say that these votes uh, Theresa May offered through gritted teeth. Let's take a listen. The House should be clear that a short extension, not beyond the end of June, would almost certainly have to be a one-off. If we had not taken part in the European Parliament elections, it would be extremely difficult to extend again. So it would create a much sharper cliff edge in a few months' time. An extension cannot take no deal off the table. The only way to do that is to revoke Article 50, which I, which I shall not do, or agree a deal. OK, let's cross live now to Westminster our course, with our correspondent Vincent McAvinney there. Vincent, these are big moves from uh, Theresa May. Uh, what a reaction uh, have we heard so far? Good evening, Tessa. Well, that's right. This is huge for Theresa May. For months, she has been saying it's my deal or no deal. But it seems once again, the prime minister was not being honest. We understand this morning that there was a big fight over this in cabinet. Some of the Brexiteer government ministers like Andrea Leadsom and Gavin Williamson, very unhappy that the prime minister was doing this because, frankly, her predecessor, Margaret Thatcher, once said the lady is not for turning. But this is another U-turn from Theresa May. She is making a career of them by bringing these three votes and it has had a big reaction here many in the ERG which is meeting in a little while the hardcore Brexiteers are deeply unhappy that the Prime Minister has done this because the pressure is now on them to simply back her unchanged at the moment withdrawal agreement or jeopardize the whole of Brexit and of course everyone here still reeling from the news in the past 24 hours as well that Jeremy Corbyn has also changed tack here's what he has to say on his proposed second referendum the Prime Minister's botched deal provides no certainty or guarantees for the future and was comprehensively rejected by this House. We cannot risk our country's industry and people's livelihoods. And so 
If, somehow, if it somehow does pass in some form at a later stage, we believe there must be a confirmatory public vote to see if people feel that's what they voted for. Well, I'm joined now by John McTernan, who was an advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair. John, thank you for joining us here on Euronews. Can I ask you first about Jeremy Corbyn? What was your reaction when, he, uh, when you heard that he had made this change last night? I was very pleased that he puts pressure on the government, but more importantly, it fulfills what the Labour Party voted for at the party conference last year. They, were, they called for a second referendum. If uh, there was no possibility of a general election, there's no possibility of a general election. It's time to put pressure on the government and to let this choice go back to the people if the parliament's deadlocked. It seems like a bit of a victory for the shadow Brexit Secretary Sir Keir Starmer. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn had to really be dragged, kicking and streaming to this? Look, I think Jeremy is instinctively uh, not in favour of being in the European Union. His party is, the unions are, uh, his shadow cabinet are, his membership are. So, look, he's got to do this. I think St Keir Starmer has uh, played a very clever game, not dragging Jeremy necessarily, bringing him carefully in a strategic way to this point. Um, and also, you've got to accept that the resignation of Labour MPs last week to join the independent group must have put some pressure on too. It must have made him realise there's another place for Remain voters to go to in British politics. They don't simply have a choice of the Labour Party uh, or the Liberal Democrats. There's somewhere else to go. I spoke last week with Mike Gapes here on Euronews, one of the independent group, who said they were talking to lots of MPs from Labour that were thinking of jumping ship. Do you think this might have stemmed the tide because they had been building some real momentum behind themselves with the latest polling showing them about 18% support versus Labour's 23%? Yeah, look, I think this... I think basically a lot of MPs said to Mike Gapes and his, uh, his colleagues who left, the handful of colleagues who left, that this wasn't the time, that the focus had to be on Brexit. And I think what's happened is that, in a way, uh, the seven members of the Labour Party are leaving, it's, it's the cork out the bottle, it's relieved some of the pressure, it's allowed Jeremy Corbyn to move his position without feeling he's conceding to Chuka or to Mike or to the others. Um, and it's allowed uh, those people in the Labour Party who think that Brexit is the biggest issue facing us to say that they can stay uh, in step with Jeremy at the moment. And also maybe given them even more leverage to get him to change his, his point of view, which is like he's seen people leave, therefore if he's got to stop other people leaving, he's got to do something that placates them, that moves to the centre ground. So rather than managing to his left, to his factional support to the left, he's got to manage the se centre of the Tory part, the Labour Party. Just very, very quickly, you've worked inside Downing Street. What do you make of Theresa May's operation and this U-turn? Well, look, if Theresa May had plotted this two years ago when she decided to set off on this, uh, she would have known she needed uh, some Labour votes. So she should have started two years ago finding a way to create a space for Labour votes and for Liberal Democrats and for other, even the SNP. If she needs cross-party support, she should have earned it. At the moment, she's trying still to, to stampede people, to scare people, to push them uh, into uh, supporting her. That, that strategy is failing, and so she's had to move. John, thank you very much. Tessa, back to you now in Brussels. All right, thank you for that, Vincent McAvinney. Uh, all right, Nick, I'll start with you. It's a massive shift, it seems, in, in <laughs> Theresa May's uh, strategy. Was she forced into doing this now that she, you know, there, her, she has no more options and therefore she has to do this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, her strategy throughout has been to, you know, delay, to kick the can further down the road, as the, the phrase has idiom. become. <laughs> our favourite idiom. Um, yeah, she had no choice. She had a load of Remainer cabinet ministers saying, look, we're going to resign mm. if uh, you don't give us the option to take no deal off the table. Why is she put extending Article 50 on? Partly because of that and partly as well because she wants to focus the minds of her Brexiteer Mm. MPs, what are they most worried about? Mm. Well, they're most worried about being stuck in because they think the longer you're in, the more you delay it. Actually, the bigger chance there is that the whole thing ends up I getting I think reversed. what's interesting, um, you know, when uh, the interview there was saying, he was saying, interviewee there, saying that she was, she started to scare people, but then by taking the no deal off the table, isn't that taking away the stakes? Like, isn't this... Well, not really, because we, know, we know that Parliament is not in favour of no deal. They have voted mm -hmm. twice mm -hmm. in motions that have not bound the government uh, but they have voted to essentially say that no deal is not an option. So in those circumstances, and we've known this for weeks, and actually where we are, we could have predicted a couple of months ago, this is probably where we would have ended up, mm. certainly after Theresa May lost that vote by historic uh, proportions. Um, in saying that, she didn't have a choice in that she was stuck between this rock and a hard place of uh, those kind of soft remainers within her cabinet and ministers threatening to resign, essentially, mm. if she didn't put this possibility of an extension on the table. Um, and
stand between the Brexiteers who clearly um, essentially want to see Brexit happen. Mm. Uh, the interesting thing is what they do next. Yeah. Uh, because there is a thought process, and it is entirely plausible that despite that massive defeat only six weeks ago or so, uh, less than that, um, Theresa May's deal could still go through. Mm. And Brexiteers will have to tonight and over the coming days ask themselves that question that do they now back May's deal as bad as they think it is or is the alternative worse for them, which is essentially a potentially very long extension mm. with still the possibility of a second referendum and losing Brexit altogether? Indeed, and there is that idea of a second referendum. Yeah, Petra, how is this being viewed now from this side? Um, you know, a, Jeremy Corbyn saying it could possibly back a second referendum. Does it make Brexit a lot less uh, uh, possible, the, the prospect of it? At least it should make no deal uh, impossible. I have received many, many organizations and uh, people from UK to lobby or meet me. And I said, you should go to the other side of the channel <laughs> and not to bring the problems of the hard Brexit to our labs and, and, and to us and MEPs and, and Brussels. But then uh, I think that it is, should also be possible to see that uh, British people and democracy would have the set of second option to vote for me uh, uh, and supporting Labour turn now here openly because that was what we have seen all the time. Right after the referendum, we noticed there was no plan to be outside of the UK and uh, mm. the outside for UK to be outside. And then uh, we noticed that there were like a false promises right after. So then why not we do have a, a deal mm -hmm. renegotiated or this old deal to compare with the remain that would be very much well, uh, I mean, supporting the, the, democracy the, the, yeah, and at the, the same time the have two a new arguments say. against that is I don't think there is necessarily widespread public uh, <laughs> appetite. view or appetite mm. for the British public to have a second referendum mm -hmm. and if there was one I'm not entirely sure you would get a different result. No. Uh, where Theresa May is right today though is that essentially it, apart from revoking Article mm. 50 by extending this you don't actually deal with the fundamentals and you do just push that cliff edge, that decision sure. uh, down Running the road. Down you the cannot another... rule out no deal sure. unless there is another deal in place. An extension okay. is simply delaying I'm, of course, I looking would... at the opinion polls and yeah. that the figures are yeah. more for Remain than Brexit now. And now there's yeah, more. There are facts on the table. More facts on the table. It was before the referendum two and a half yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Being subject. Yeah. All right, I'll bring in another voice because uh, Malta's Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, he did comment this week on the prospect of the UK rejoining... The UK rejoining the EU, that is. He told Politico that, quote, our aim should be that our generation, we make sure that the European project thrives in a way that the next generation of British politicians ask for their country to rejoin the European Union. I mean, is there any uh, surprise at that, you know, that kind of, that the reaction here would... Uh, on rejoining? Um, well, I mean, the, on the Corbyn stuff, mm -hmm. quickly on that, um, I mean, the people I've kind of spoken to on the EU side this morning are, are pretty sceptical about what he's done. Mm. Um, they think it's all internal party management and mm. it's a bit cynical and that actually he's doing it because he knows that not enough MPs are ever going to vote to hold a second referendum anyway. With Remain uh, as an option. With mm. Remain <laughs> as an option. O on okay. Britain rejoining, I mean, this is something that's been raised before. Um, Jean-Claude well, Juncker it mentioned it. Hasn't it hasn't left yet. No, it hasn't left yet. It hasn't left yet. But if it, okay, once it does, or if it does, if it ever does, Mia Petra, do you think the EU should accept the UK back, or would it? No, oh, of course, uh, it's, there is always uh, a room for new member states. New it, member yeah, states. Yeah, so new member states. I know all the ones that become the, the, like the, question. Uh, the question for you is, with, yeah. with a rebate, not exactly, in Schengen, yeah. not a member of the Euro, the cherries, like, uh, are Europeans really willing to accept Britain back with all the qualifications they already have? Um, I, I was... I happily talk with the next generation okay. when I looked the, the results after the Brexit and now you look how the young people voted. Mm. So this is what uh, Muscat also refers to. We know each other from the political life. The young people in, uh, in Britain, they are not voting in favour of Brexit. They didn't last time. They were calling for the cooperation and they ask where are the more possibilities after Brexit when they see the map shrinking with their yeah. uh, possibilities for the Europe. I mean, so, okay, so it is just just on, on, on Europe being warm to Britain at the moment. <laughs> uh, clearly, you know, we've had the Austrian Chancellor in the last couple of days saying that perfectly happy to have an extension of Article 50. Uh, the Luxembourg Prime Minister today suggesting that the European Union elections, which are due at the end of May, shouldn't be an obstacle to extending Article 50. Clearly, uh, Europe is trying to create an atmosphere, at least, mm -hmm. uh, to engender an extension because there is still a glimmer of hope 
that potentially Britain might not leave in the end. I, mean, I think that's what is in the minds of politicians here. All right, so let's uh, see what people actually think about that idea uh, of the UK rejoining, once it leaves, uh, the European Union. Alex and Morgan, you've been talking to people about this uh, question. Uh, tell us what you have. Well, listening to you guys discuss there, one point I want to pick up after what Darren said, similar to what Ricardo tweeted to me this morning on this question, if the UK was now to say, you know what, this Brexit thing, oh, I'm not so sure, should they be allowed back? Well, this is what Ricardo had to say. He says, yes, the UK should be allowed back. We're all better together. But look at this. But I don't think conditions, including the Thatcher rebate that you were just, uh, you were just discussing there, as an example, should be the same as before. The idea that the UK shouldn't go back to exactly where it was, that there must be some implication from the Brexit process. Interesting point. Let's bring in some people who definitely think the UK should be allowed back in. I want to start uh, with Irene. She's Spanish. She uh, works in the media industry. And for her, any talk of a change in relations is talk of penalty politics, if you like. This is what she had to say. Well, the UK is still here. I think they should stay and we should help them stay. I don't believe in politics of punishment or sanction. I don't believe in politics of punishment or sanction. Then another perspective, interestingly, Frances, she's uh, a student. She's from Puerto Rico, but lives and studies in France. And has a bit of an interesting perspective, given that context. This is her take on what's going on all around her. As an American student, I think the European Union should allow the UK to remain. This will be beneficial for both parties, even though discussions right now are really difficult. And also, it could be a lesson to all the European countries that a unified European Union is better and stronger. Better and stronger. And then actually, something sent to me in the cube, a quote uh, sent to me on Facebook from Anais, a really interesting perspective here. She's English, French, born in England, lives in France. She says, yes, I want the UK to stay. But also, a line about the EU here, the idea that the UK leaving is a failure for them. She says it feels like a failure. Okay, let's move down a little bit and bring in some more nuance, perhaps from the business perspective. Rem uh, brings us that on Twitter. He's a uh, member of a think tank posting from the Netherlands, and he says after speaking to businesses there, they're all left questioning, well, if the UK now remains, who's going to pick up the bill for all the no-deal planning, all the Brexit planning that companies have done? And then, just to end, if I might, on a view that is a little more extreme from uh, Franz, uh, Francois. He is a business director in France, and this is his take on the UK. F them, he told us. From right down in their core, they have never been European. So it's fine. Let them leave, no problem. All voices, Tessa, all views, and certainly all welcome in the cube. Indeed. And, 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 all, and all languages, that. Alex, by the, by the looks of things. <laughs> I mean, I think that last perspective is... I don't think that's very common here in the EU. What do you think? Um, I don't think... I mean, it's it. not in the EU institutions, but I'm sure there are lots of Europeans who uh, will be happy to see Britain leave, <laughs> actually. It's been somewhat of the kind of the, the difficult child in the room at times. Um, but I think overall, I get a sense that most Europeans are disappointed. That Britain but you, you raise a good point, um, and, and what Alice picked... Alex picked up on, it's that the cherry picking, this is the very reason mm -hmm. why the EU was standing very firm, because the UK just kept cherry picking. They weren't budging on that. I think it's good and fair that the UK should, and people, British people should know that there are different uh, options and, and different exceptions for different nations, not only UK rebate. Mm -hmm. There are other countries with Denmark. the rebate. Yeah. There yeah. are other countries with uh, certain exceptions, having a snooze or whatever, uh, in, a, in a different country. So we are united, but we, don't, we are not similar. We are still like a different nationalities inside. And then sometimes I, I was working, I was Erasmus student in UK. Uh, I noticed that uh, different countries think that they are the special and only they have these exceptions. And then if they join, they have to be uh, harmonized in every, every aspect. Mm. So, I, I, but I, I, I'm very sure uh, coming from Finland that has been always been like been happy of those and some Southern uh, federalistic that there are UK, there are like Nordic perspective, a lot of cooperation, and not only because of the language, exchange student sure. programs and, and people working but there, so it has been a great to be there. If there were to be a question again of whether the UK should, should remain, I know, Darren, you don't think that the public opinion has changed. What about you, Nick? Do you think it has changed? Not massively. Uh, but it would, you, you can do you look think at... remain would probably gain this time? Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm, mm. you know, I'm really not. Um, I mean, firstly, as 
lockdown said, you know, the opinion polls kind of overestimated Remain a bit last time. I know the polls just say they've, they've fixed that, but it's, you know, it's a very hard thing to predict. Um, you know, whatever happens, if you have a second referendum, you're going to get another narrow margin one way or the other. So what happens if you have 52, 48 Remain? I mean, do you do best of best three? three? Is it like yeah. a tennis match? <laughs> it's, uh, so there's no evidence that you've got a huge swing like 60, 40 plus, which is actually going to put the thing to bed. Mm. Um, it would be a, a knife edge again. I think most people think and, it's and very divisive. And I think, I think it would turn into well. a referendum that wasn't just about Britain's membership of the European Union. It would turn into a referendum about trust in politics and politicians sure. yeah. holding the word. And actually, there are some soft Remainers who, you know, voted to remain in, who mm. think that the people of Britain have voted and that that decision has to be upheld by the government and to do so is a betrayal of democracy mm. and in a second referendum they would vote to leave. But then also politics okay, is not only idea. about yeah. ideas, okay. it is also about the cooperation and the decision-making capacity. And now we don't see that in Britain, and that is what we have been looking for, that they should be able Actually, to decide. OK, just one to ten, Darren, the likelihood of the of British people going back to the polls for another referendum. Uh, I still think it's very slim. slim. I'd still okay. say one or two out of ten. OK, that's what Darren says there. All right, coming up <laughs> on Raw Politics, the rise of the anti-vax movement in Europe after a boy from France is blamed for reintroducing measles to Costa Rica. Plus, Austria proposes tough new rules for asylum seekers, including detentions based on suspicions they will commit a crime. That's next. Welcome back to Raw Politics. So Austria has unveiled some tough and controversial proposals for asylum seekers, and the government is not being shy about its intentions. It says it wants to deter migrants from seeking asylum in the country. Now, the measures include detaining asylum seekers on suspicion they will commit a crime without a court order. Austria's reception centers would also be renamed departure centers, and asylum seekers would be expected to abide by a voluntary curfew between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Now, ahead of the announcement, Austrian leader Sebastian Kurz, he had this to say about the measures. Ziel ist es, die Möglichkeit der Sicherungshaft zu schaffen, natürlich in einem ordentlichen rechtsstaatlichen Rahmen mit richterlicher Kontrolle und auch nur bei konkreten Verdachtsmomenten und konkret definierten Straftaten. Well, joining me to discuss this now is Angelica Mlinar, an Austrian MEP who sits with the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. We have uh, Nick Guthridge still with us, Brussels correspondent with The Sun, and also our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. All right, I'll start with you, Angelica. I mean, what is being proposed here, it is controversial. Uh, first of all, it is a preventative measure, as Sebastian Kurtz said, you can potentially be suspected of committing a crime. I mean, what does, what does this say about this measure? It says it all. I mean, uh, it's basically a provocation. It will never go through because in order to uh, put this into reality, you would need a change of the constitutional law in Austria. And thanks heavens, uh, this government doesn't have the necessary two-third majority, so they would need the opposition to go along. I do not see this happening. So if it doesn't get through, then what is this? Is it an election tactic? Yes. What is he doing? It is clearly election tactics. It's uh, quite obvious that uh, uh, the election uh, campaigns are going, uh, uh, you know, regarding the European elections are against uh, migrants mm. in general. And this is uh, what uh, the EPP, in Austria mm. is uh, doing as well as the far right. I mean, even though, OK, this might be uh, rhetoric for election purposes, I and mean, this still creates quite a dangerous kind of conversation, line of conversation, where asylum seekers or migrants become second-class citizens almost. Uh, well, it does, and it's also um, it's a bit of a problem for the EU in general. I mean, obviously, mm. there's already the problem with uh, Viktor Orban, very well known what, what the Hungarians are doing uh, with migration there and the kind of rhetoric we've got. Sebastian Kurz, uh, of course, has got a far-right party in coalition with himself. I mean, we saw the words that they were using. They were saying this is designed for people who have already strapped a bomb on in their minds. In their I mean, mind. That's, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, in their mind. I mean, you sure. can't have the thought police, you know. Sure. It's, um, so in terms of, you know, the European perspective, mm. how do you deal with governments that are saying things like this, which go against European values. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you've got to keep them in the fold. You know, they don't want to alienate 
Sebastian Kurz, another leader. Just to pick up on a point there, on the other hand, if you look at this, you, you're, you're talking about strapping a bomb uh, in their minds, but there is a, a, an element of almost terrorism or security risk in well, this. I mean, so is Austria protecting the, the, itself? There, 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 are, there are several points here. First of all, Austria would say that actually what they're proposing is in place in several European countries sure. already, and not just Hungary, places like Ireland as well. Uh, that clearly there uh, are high-profile the high cases involving migrants and asylum, case, uh, asylum seekers involved in either terrorism or crime. crime. Yeah. Now, it is not disproportionate to the rest of the population, and we should emphasise that. Sure. I should also say that, you know, the number of asylum applications in Austria is measured in the hundreds per mm -hmm. month, uh, not in the thousands, and well below the 12,000 who uh, applied for asylum back in October 2015. The numbers have gone. This is an election issue, yes, but why is it an election issue? Because it still matters to the to general people. public. Sure. And we can't get away from that. You may say it's because of mistruths or because people are not being told uh, what's actually happening or distortion of the numbers, mm. but clearly migration is going to be a key issue during this election and at the moment yet again it is the populist right who are winning in terms of at least the rhetoric of this conversation and that comes back to other politicians of like well you, someone's got to step up to the plate and take this argument on because at the moment you're losing it. and again we're talking about legitimate fear Angelica I, I mean I know your position on the issue but um, is there is there a legitimate um, reason why Sebastian Kurtz will be talking about this is that he's protecting protecting his citizens and addressing a fear that exists among people I mean, I don't want to sound uh, too abstract, but I mean, mm. there are two levels to it. First of all, I mean, the security versus freedom issue has been uh, basically a debate that uh, we have been having here in the House, in the European Parliament, for many years now. Yeah. And uh, make no mistake, one ounce of uh, security costs a kilo of freedom. Well, I mean, it's a choice to be taken. This is one, one, one level. The second issue, I mean, that there is uh, a security or, let's say, um, a fear within the population present. I give this to you. I'm, 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 I sign up to it. Uh, however, I think the fears come from completely different areas. And this is an area of digitalization, fear of losing jobs. I mean, fear of what the future will look like uh, for, for, for the average uh, person. And this is something that uh, all of us have to tackle. And also we liberals, we have mm -hmm. to find some, some answers to this. And Okay. But it, it, it sure. does raise questions. I mean, we are talking here about asylum seekers, mm -hmm. about people who... I mean, let's remember who asylum seekers are. They are people uh, normally in very desperate need. And if the European Union can't be a home for asylum seekers, essentially, where in the world can be? Sure. Uh, and this is something that Europe is having to grapple with an awful lot. But I, I come back to this point, which is essentially, you know, the public are fearful of change out there. They are yeah. fearful of migration. And... This is an argument the centre, and particularly the centre-left, have not been able to take on mm. and win for years and years now. And they've got no-one to blame, I'm sorry, for themselves, but apart from themselves. Do you think there is a double standard, as, as Darren was pointing out, that there are different, um, uh, to an extent, different rules that exist in different countries on screening uh, asylum seekers or, or people coming to Europe? Is there a double standard? Or, or, are we harder in Austria because of Sebastian Kurz or what he stands for? Uh, I, I, we maybe are a bit harder on Austria. I think rhetoric is part of it, and, you know, some of the stuff he said has been pretty strong. Uh, yeah, there are some double standards, which is why the EU is actually trying to come up now with a, a centralised asylum system. But, of course, that's incredibly difficult because it's being blocked by countries like Austria who think it's way too soft. I mean, you know, we were supposed to have the, mm. the refugee quotas for reallocation. I mean, they just died a death because... You know, basically, a handful of countries refuse to, to take part in them. So you're always going to get that. We've got this kind of ad hoc system where someone like Spain so says, we'll take yeah. a few in here, and others say, no way, we're not having it. Um, last question. We don't, we, we don't have much time, but you, you said this me these measures are not going to pass, but is there a version that's a watered-down version that could possibly make it through? This is always the same uh, the tactic. tactic. You know, mm -hmm. that you basically ask for 150% and then you get 90%, and sure. this is already bad enough. However, I think we are still mixing up here asylum seekers and actually migration as such. Mm -hmm. You know, we do not even get our asylum package basically in place that uh, we have been uh, negotiated on, on, on mm. an EU level because uh, several member states actually block it. But what we would also need is like an organised migration system. All it, right. And this is something that politically is not uh, feasible these OK, days. well, we'll leave it at that because we'll have to move on. We'll talk about the euro because has the euro been a blessing or a burden for your country? The results are in and while it's looking good for some, the results may come as a shock to others. Let's take a look. When the 
superhero first burst onto the stage 20 years ago, it was mostly met with enthusiasm. But two decades on and a new study shows that promised prosperity may have only been true for some, not all. According to the Center for European Policy, while Germany and the Netherlands are the winners when it comes to the euro, Italy and France aren't so lucky. When it comes to prosperity, Germany gained 1.9 trillion euros from the currency and the Netherlands 346 billion. Whereas Italy was the biggest loser with a fall of 4.3 trillion, France was just above but still lost out on 3.6 trillion euros. While the debate on the wealth of the euro lives on, could this study further stack the odds against it? Yeah, does this validate your skeptics thinking that Germany is well, the only one that benefits mean, from this? Yeah, but, 30 I mean, seconds, I don't, I don't think it's your skepticism. <laughs> We've known that for a while. These figures definitely bear that out. We have got to the point, though, where the euro is essentially too big to fail. I mean, you would crash okay. the entire continent's economy if it was. But it still needs ridiculously fundamental structural changes. And, and it does still not hasn't seem been the political them. appetite for no. it. No, it hasn't been addressed. All right, coming up on Raw Politics, vaccine skepticism lines up with a rise in populism. According to a new report, find out which European countries have the highest number of vaccine skeptics when we come back. Welcome back to our politics. Now, an unvaccinated French boy holidaying in Costa Rica is suspected of reintroducing measles to the country, a disease that had been eradicated for five years. The deployment the development highlights French and other European families' growing resistance to vaccinations. In 2018, more than 82,000 Europeans contracted measles, the highest in a year so far this decade. Now, the disease also killed 72 children and adults last year. And joining me to discuss this is Christian Silvio Boussoy, a Romanian MEP with the European People's Party here at the Parliament, and French MEP from the Rassemblement National, Bruno Golnitsch. And still with us is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. All right, um, I'll start with you, Mr. Boussoy, because you have been your doctor and you've been studying, um, looking into the anti-vaccination movement. So what... Has it been getting worse? Like, is this the point where you can say that in Europe, this is the worst point? Yes, uh, it is a situation uh, that we have to tackle, that we have to improve. Uh, I think that uh, many would agree that uh, vaccination is the only tool to prevent deaths. It is estimated that 2.5 million uh, lives are saved uh, worldwide uh, due to vaccination. And many diseases which were uh, untreatable before the vaccines were uh, founded or found, uh, now they are treated. Of course, uh, what we are experiencing now in some European countries is uh, a lower uh, rate of vaccination. Mm. This is mainly due to vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also the, the effect of uh, some campaigns uh, with a lot of fake news, with a lot of... Uh, uh, exaggerations, uh, exaggerating uh, the adverse I mean, effects of some vaccines. I there are parents that genuinely feel that, you know, they don't, they want to have the choice to not have their children vaccinated. I, I'll go to you, Mr. Goldish, because you are not anti-vaccinations per se, but there are mandatory vaccinations in France, and you don't like that. Uh, well, well, uh, up to now, there were three uh, compulsory uh, mm -hmm. vaccines. But uh, now it's uh, uh, the, from, from 1st of January, there are 11. Mm -hmm. And really, we think that 11 is crazy, especially uh, for newborn babies. We, we, we just uh, we, we think that it infringes the uh, precautionary principle. But if they're medically principle, to be needed, let, then... Yes, but you, for example, you're a medical doctor. Uh, let's give the, the example of one of these uh, compulsory vaccines. I say, uh, uh, ma'am. MEMPS. MEMPS is not so serious when, 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 when you're, 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 you're a kid. But if you get... But the problem is vaccination will last, will protect you how many years? Five years, 10 years, 15 years? And if you get it, for example, if you get MEMPS when, when you're an adult, mm. then you can become ster sterile, sterile. Mm. And, uh, and, and there are many, many I, such examples. So uh, we, we just ask for precautionary yeah, principle not, and freedom of choice. The adverse effects are, are really uh, very little in comparison with the good effects, with the advantages of vaccination. Of course, I could agree just yeah. a little part of uh, okay. what my colleague are say, is saying, that uh, obligation, 
vaccination obligation is not always the best case. But there's a very relevant case. Relevant vaccines. Yeah, in France, the situation is like this. The idea is to uh, improve the communication, to improve the knowledge, but to organize public awareness campaigns, to explain, and okay. the community, scientific uh, community beyond, and decision makers beyond, to explain okay, the advantages. Beyond the vaccines themselves, yeah. Okay, if we don't vaccinate um, the kids, you, it's not just about your choice. You're also mm. putting other children in danger. Isn't that... Yeah, I mean, but that's what, that's that... what I, Yeah, of course. And, 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 and for, for uh, measles, you know, you need an, a, a vaccination rate of, I think, about 93 95% of the population of, uh, of children in order to prevent uh, the, the disease being able to spread. And you're right. I mean, it's not just about protecting your own child. Yeah. It's about the protection of others, as this case in Costa Rica has shown. What I can't understand is... What, what, even if it is compulsory, what, why mm -hmm. the objection to vaccinations? But what, what, well, what, okay, well, what, what, what is, what is exactly is vaccination? Okay, I'll give you a quick answer vaccination to that. Vaccination is, is injecting illness. Yes, a soft, a soft yeah. uh, illness, yes. Can you, can you be sure that you, uh, when, when, when you will inject 11 vaccines in a newborn baby, there won't be in, in, a, in a few years or months no, but you minimize uh, side, results, you? side effects. There are some, some of these diseases, for example, are very, very rare. And if you have vaccination, there are always vaccination okay. uh, uh, side effects. Maybe one, one person, one, right. uh, one thousand, even one million. I'd like to bring in another for, aspect to million. this uh, discussion. Mm. I will, I'll bring in another discussion to uh, another um, aspect and angle to this discussion because we do have uh, someone on the line because there is a new study published in the European Journal of Public Health saying that there is a link uh, between people who vote for populist parties and vaccine skepticism. Uh, joining us live now from London is the lead author of that report, Jonathan Kennedy. All right, I'd like to bring up uh, this graphic where we're showing that there is that link, according to the study, uh, between populism in certain countries and the anti-vaccination movement. All right, Jonathan, do you mind explaining to us the link that you found in this study? No, no problem at all. So if we look at the graph, we see in the top right-hand corner, we have a few countries that have very high levels of vaccine skepticism and also very high levels of votes for populist parties. So we have Italy, Greece, and, and France. And then when we look in the bottom left-hand corner of the graph, we see countries like Portugal and Belgium, where a very small proportion of the population vote for populist parties, and there's also very low levels of vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, and that's not a coincidence, uh, if, if that's what uh, we can get from your study. So what is that link? What is it that links the two, uh, perhaps a principle at the core of this? Well, I think we really have to think what um, populism is. And populism is fundamentally a distrust and a suspicion and a anger towards established um, experts and, and elites. And so in the political sphere, this manifests itself as a... Um, hostility towards established political parties and increasing support for anti-establishment parties like Syriza and Front National and the Five Star Movement. And if we look at the sphere of, of, of public health, we see it manifest itself as a hostility and a suspicion towards ministries of health, towards medical professionals and towards pharmaceutical companies. So the underlying um, dynamic is the suspicion towards elites and experts. All right, uh, just very quickly, do you, would you, from your research, say that uh, there is a responsibility on populist leaders that you, and those parties that you've just mentioned in the rise of the anti-vax uh, movement? I think they're not entirely responsible. Um, they didn't create the atmosphere of, of um, political disenfranchise, disenfranchisement and um, economic marginalization that led to this this feeling of, 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 of suspicion towards elites and experts, but they're certainly in a very cynical and very nefarious way exploiting these, these emotions. All right, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, there. The author of that uh, study uh, linking populism with the anti-vax movement, Jonathan Kennedy there. All right, yes, I would, uh, would you like uh, to comment? There is no need of any survey. It's quite natural. Sure. People, people doubt what, uh, of the, what, what the government says, and, and they rightfully doubt about it even in the field of a health policy. For example, if you take France, there has been a huge campaign oh. for vaccination uh, for, uh, how do you say, H1N1 influenza? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. 
uh, which, uh, which was absolutely uh, proved to be absolutely unnecessary. And there were side effects were worse I mean, than, to than a, what he To have prompted. an opinion against what the government is saying is one thing, but to actually do something that could have implications, uh, as we saw well, at the I, I can understand. I can understand. Of course, you sure. are right. There is a minimal risk of vaccinating people. That is medically true. No one can deny that. But on the, on, the, on the kind of measure of balance between doing goods and protecting millions of people every year and the consequences of it affecting a very small number of people as a side effect, you, like any it, it, responsible it, government in any responsible medical profession will have to no, protect no, millions. No, no, many medical doctors are divided in France and they have just a petition right now yeah. of medical doctors who say that's absolutely crazy to, to inject 11 vaccines to newborn babies. The anti babies. is actually higher as, in, in as, France. The idea to have 11 required. vaccines is and one. I guess you it's doubt one thing. Also. And the idea to have 11 vaccines, of course, is one thing and could be debated but it is, it's the French policy inside now. the community, scientific community. But the idea to say that all vaccines are bad, I, as it happens in many I don't countries, say that. and mm. as many uh, so-called internet influencers are doing, it's yeah. very bad. It's but very bad. I, I and agree. of course, populism is playing with people's fears. But is it that is the clear that France, there is a linkage is that, between is that populism doubt? and no. this campaign against vaccination, no, 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 which no. really uh, makes people dying. No, but there is no campaign. In my no country, campaign Romania, more than 200 children died for missiles mm -hmm. not so long time ago. And now, from influenza, we have more than 100 deaths because they were not vaccinated. So the numbers are going up. Uh, yes. For de definitely. Okay. But, but, but the, it, depends on, it depends on the illness. And uh, once again, there is a, a big principle that we always advocate in this parliament, is precautionary mm. uh, principle. Can you say that in English? Yes. 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 <laughs> and uh, uh, w w we need to know but what exactly will want, be the what side I want to effect. Ask you is... For example, polio. As for polio, I, I agree 100% that the vaccine against polio okay, but you have helped a nuanced, to reduce polio. You have polio. a nuanced perspective in that you're saying not all vaccinations are bad, that it's just the number of vaccinations that you... Okay. Yes, but and, and French some illness. But French people's opinions, because in France, 70%, only 70% of people actually believe in vaccination, according to a European survey. Mm -hmm. In France, do the people who believe in anti-vaccination, who are of that movement, do they believe in that nuance that some are good and some are not so good? Some of them think... No vaccinations, period. It, it, it depends on the people. People are free to think whatever they want. But isn't that dangerous? Isn't that dangerous? out for my so-called populist party, mm. wh wh what we, we oppose is this compulsory vaccination of 11 vaccines to newborn babies. So is there so a... I, 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 all, I would, all I would add to that is, you know, it shouldn't be up to... And I'm sure it's not up to politicians to decide what vaccines, mm. vac vaccines should be done. It should be up to medical professionals who know what they're talking about. And if that involves... In va vaccinating babies with 11 vaccines, if they think, Here's if one. the medical professionals who know but so, don't. But so don't. much more about this, well, clearly no, some of them do. The, the majority okay. of the medical profession, even in France, well. is of this opinion. When it was a decision of the 11 vaccines, it was a decision taken on the majority of the opinions of the medical profession. And it was so. taken by people which has respons have responsibilities in the field of health. They didn't go against the population. They did to protect the population. What could be accepted is that uh, obligation with penalties sometimes is not working. Even could increase the vaccine hesitancy. It's better to make efforts to explain to people, to mm -hmm. make campaigns, to bring all those from the scientific community which are supporting and have arguments, strong arguments, to support the vaccines, to explain to the people. And in, with this, it is a big chance that the vaccine hesitancy Will decrease. And what about, like, uh, in, in Italy, the move to um, to not make it mandatory? Uh, to... Well, it was then reversed because yeah, then it, it was, it was reversed exactly. because exactly. there was an understanding that it will do public harm to people's health. And that we are not talking about, uh, you know, selecting schools or we're talking about people's children's lives here. And I'm sorry, if the majority of the medical profession say that this is necessary to protect children's lives, not just your child's lives, well, but other children's lives. I'm going to trust the medical profession because you know what? I don't know that much about medicine. But but you're completely wrong. The the the, 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 the profession is divided. And would you would you say that it is majority as a vote here? Uh, excuse me, but it's absolutely irrelevant. If if you so why the do you majority, think that, why do you think? Why do you I will think... give you an example. The, the majority of uh, uh, medical profession be, before Pasteur, 
uh, didn't believe that uh, uh, germs could, could uh, that, that illness was uh, uh, the result of, uh, of germs. All they right. thought that it okay. years, It's not uh, the same uh, situation. Uh, okay, we'll leave it at that the for now because we still have seats. a lot more on the program. All right, coming up, should anti-vaxxers be penalized? We want to hear from you. Stick around in the next hour for your chance to call in and tell us what you think. The contact information is on your screen. Call us at 0800-3333-7002. Email at rawpaul at euronews.com and join the debate on social media. Use the hashtag rawpolitics. It's after the break. Welcome back to our politics. Now we've heard from the politicians and now we want to hear from you. Here are tonight's hot topics on tonight's Your Call. Undoing Brexit. British Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn says he could formally back a second referendum and on the ballot, a remain option. But after nearly three costly years of messy negotiations and endless airtime, could the EU bear it? Some European leaders are ready to say, welcome back. But should the EU take Britain back? Ziel ist es, die Möglichkeit der Sicherungshaft zu schaffen. Deterrent effect. Austria has a new strategy to deter asylum requests, which would see asylum seekers detained without a court order, based on suspicions they will commit a crime. Refugee reception centers would be renamed as departure centers, and they'd also have a curfew. Is this about keeping Austrians safe, or are the proposed laws persecuting asylum seekers? Vaccine skepticism lines up with the rise in populism. According to a new report, Italy's Matteo Salvini and France's Marine Le Pen have both taken up the issue in the past. And now an unvaccinated French boy is being blamed for reintroducing measles to Costa Rica. In Australia, parents who don't vaccinate their kids lose some tax benefits. What do you think? Should anti-vaxxers be penalized? Should the EU take Britain back? Are the proposed laws persecuting asylum seekers? Should anti-vaxxers be penalized? All right, all of the contact information is on your screen. Call us for free at 0800-3333-7002. Email us, rawpoll at yournews.com or find us on social media. Use the hashtag rawpolitics and search for us on Skype. We want to see you as well. And joining me now to discuss this, we have Maeve McMahon, our Brussels correspondent for Your News. Nick Guptridge is back with us, Brussels correspondent with The Sun, and still with us, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. I mean, before we went uh, on the break, we had that interesting conversation on anti-vax. And I think the question we're asking, I'm should so they be passionate. penalized? Yes, they should. should. I didn't have a chance during that discussion to say that um, <laughs> I had the MMR <laughs> vaccination, which is meant to protect against measles, mumps, and rubella, and actually contracted mumps. I got mumps, uh, too. Yeah, <laughs> when I was at university. It was awful. So uh, I've clearly got some skin in this uh, in this in this game um uh, you know what i really think they should i think people who don't vaccinate their children uh should be penalized because it is not just about protecting your child it's about protecting other people's children but and it there is you know there is clearly a link france being a good example but there's clearly a link between children who are not vaccinated and rates of measles and it's not fair they should be punitive uh, results for the I mean, parents. your mother, Maeve, uh, what is your opinion on this? And because some mothers are saying, look, I need to have a choice on what I do with my children. Well, for me, I mean, I love vaccinations because it means that I get to go to work and my kid gets to go to creche because there's so many times when he can't go to creche because he has a temperature. Anything that I can do to make sure that he is healthy and the kids around him are healthy, mm. I'm, I'm up for it. But that said, our, my opinion is irrelevant. I want to hear from the viewers tonight. So get on the phone and call us and let us know what you think. Indeed, we'll be back. All right, so we have, again, a lot of ways to get in touch with us here. It will be back on your screen soon. So our, the phone number is free. The number is 0800-3333-7002. Email us at rawpol at euronews.com. Find us on social media. Use the hashtag rawpolitics. And again, you can find us on Skype. All right, before we go, we have time for tonight's raw moment. It comes from Vietnam, where Kim Jong-un's bodyguards have caused a stir. Do take a look.
Uh, who doesn't love mm. jogging bodyguards? What do you think, Nick? <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Uh, there was actually some really funny footage elsewhere as well of uh, one of his bodyguards when he was getting off the plane forgot to go with him. Apparently, you know, there's supposed to be someone with him at all times. Yeah. So he kind of saw him dashing down the red carpet after him in a, in a complete panic. It's great, isn't it? Can I mean, you imagine, like, a British yeah. Prime yeah. Minister? We haven't, yeah. we haven't in suits, I know. You know we haven't, we haven't sped those images up either. That, that, no. was, that was genuinely happening. But, but it is a tough job. Got to be fair, well, you? it is, right. but, you know, is he really under that much risk? I don't know. All right, yeah. again, we'd like to, we, we want to hear your views, so do get in touch with us. Thank you for watching us tonight, and you can find us on social media. Call us in at uh, your call after the show.